Good morning. Um, good morning, everybody. Morning. So today, um, today we are moving, transitioning, finally to uh, to see concrete projects and uh, initiatives that have been taking place in uh, marginal communities, underserved uh, communities, slums, favelas. We we know that. The conceptual demarcation is a complicated one, the one that we have. Um, and since we have seen that the problem or the issue or the phenomenon we're looking at is extremely complex and even hard to, hard to harness, it would be um, um, mistaken to now present solutions and, and have you know kind of like a row of magical best practices that can be explained in eight minutes. It's a very daunting task. <coughs> Ten, ten minutes, ten minutes, we're gonna, we decided ten minutes, <laughs> <laughs> we negotiated ten minutes. Um, uh, far from that, um, the, the presentations that we have today have not the aim to present magical uh, silver bullets to uh, some sort of problem, but rather to present and debate what aspects, um, what aspects of these projects and initiatives might be long-ranging both in time and in space, or going to essential dimensions of the issues they describe. In that sense, I would, I would say they, the, the presenters and the projects that we have uh, selected, they fulfill a set of blurred requirements. One is that they work cross-disciplinary, or better said, they are blurred in what discipline they tackle. They are not necessarily architectural or planning or community development, but they, their aim that they pursue is what defines the discipline that they have. In that way, we try to overcome what often comes, uh, often appears as a siloed discussion. Also, these projects and, and these initiatives are long-ranged in time. It means that they are not uh, one-time um, ob uh, landing objects into the landscape, but they're part of uh, what we recognize and even, um, um, I would say we applaud or commend our long-term commitments or um, yeah, long-term commitments to to the communities or to the issues they address. And a third aspect that could be perhaps more discussed is that we think that that some aspects of these projects are tackling systemic conditions of these problems. It does not mean that they can let's say easily be scaled up or multiplied or taken away, but in a way, they, they don't um, tackle superficial issues or problems, but underlying um, problems that we have identified. Rahul and I um, are going to moderate the, this um, discussion and, and jump in any time. Yeah, yeah. um, <laughs> we'll moderate uh, the discussions in two sessions, and where we have mixed uh, some projects that are more visual or spatial or material, and some others that are more um, 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 community or, inter or process or policy making. I would say that all of them have, are related to a process and not exactly to, to an object. For the sessions, each speaker will, uh, will have around 10 minutes. We didn't aim to have a TED talk, so again, it's, it's not because we wanted to have you know, a synthetic portrayal of a solution, it's rather because we prefer to have time for discussion and debate among the speakers and with the public about the relevance and the meaning of these solutions. And after that, we'll open to Q&A uh, with the public. Uh, part of the first group of speakers, we, we will um, start with a presentation from Theresa Williamson, founder and director of Catholic, Catalytic Communities. And as we said yesterday, um, the full bios are on the website. We, just for the sake of time and paper, we, we briefly introduce them here. Uh, next, we'll have um, a presentation from Livia Rodriguez, the executive director of the El Cano Martin Peña Enlace Project in Puerto Rico. Next, we will have Fernando de Melo, um, former secretary of housing and current director of the Urban Institute of Urbanism and Studies for the Metropolis in Sao Paulo. And finally, we'll have a Michael Uwemedimo, lecturer in film at the University of Roehampton and uh, project director of the Collaborative Media Advocacy Platform. Um, Theresa, if you want, we'll start with you. Thank you. Um, 
that's opening. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's a huge honor and it's a wonderful opportunity to bring the work we've been doing in Brazil for 18 years to this forum to debate and learn from everyone and share what we've been doing. Um, the, the, what I was asked to talk about was our approach and, and uh, sharing our approach. Um, when I got that invitation, I, I, I hadn't had that invitation before. Usually I talk about some of the issues facing favelas in Rio, um, some of the, the how communities are organizing. I rarely talk about how we uh, respond and how we as an organization work. So I'm going to try to do that today, uh, talk about Catalytic Communities, which is our NGO. Um, but I'm also going to frame it, obviously, in the reality of the favelas in Rio. Uh, I want to mention that we are working with community land trusts now, thanks to the inspiration from Livia's organization, uh, the Caño Martín Peña in, in Puerto Rico, is presenting next. So I decided not to talk about the approach that we're taking on community land trust specifically or any of our individual projects, but rather as an organization. Um, I just want to preface this, and don't worry if the slide's not very clear. Um, it's just a standard slide I've been actually using since 2000. Um, and I want to use it here just to describe how this all started. Um, I'm originally from Rio, but I moved to Washington when I was six years old. I was raised, my mother worked at the World Bank. Um, I saw uh, people working in international institutions trying to do uh, good work around the world. Um, I also, you know, there were, there was, uh, I was also part of communities trying to change things um, politically here in the U.S. growing up. Um, but I went back to Brazil, where I was originally from, uh, on vacation regularly. Uh, but I had never visited favelas. And in 2000, I was working on a PhD in city planning uh, with the intention of going back to work in Brazil. I was uh, working at Penn. Um, and when I got back to Brazil, I started working in favelas and I started visiting them with every chance I had. I was 25 years old and, and what I wanted to do at the time was just simply understand the reality to see what I could do, how I could make a dissertation that was going to be useful. Um, and these are projects that I saw in the first couple of months visiting favelas back in 2000. They were communities building their own sewage systems, communities building housing collectively, uh, sewing cooperatives, eco-brick manufacturing, child care centers, elderly care centers, um, anything you could think of, it felt like, uh, that a community would be facing as a challenge, there were people on the ground addressing those issues. Um, and I was amazed because that was really what came across to me as the, the prime uh, characteristic of favelas. It was this constant at attempt by residents to improve their lives with limited means, with, with uh, often um, society against them in many ways. And um, another slide I wasn't originally going to include because I know that we're all talking about this. Everybody here knows what uh, informal settlements are, but the conference is using the word slum. And this is the definition that as an organization working in over 200 favelas over the years, we've come to use that characterizes all the favelas in Rio. And this is very different, I would say, from the definition of slum. Um, that many of you would use. For example, substandard housing is actually not part of this definition. There's a lot of housing in Rio that is in favelas that are consolidated favelas that have been around for a while where uh, the housing is not necessarily substandard. Um, what we see that defines them is simply their neighborhoods that develop out of an unmet need for housing. Um, there's no outside regulation and this is what makes them so diverse. Um, they're established by residents uh, even if later there are other investments but the the bricks, every brick, every tile in a community was laid by residents, right? There's an embedded history in favelas uh, that we just don't experience um, in formal city environments uh, and that we often don't recognize or don't see because our living environments aren't similar. Um, there's, uh, and they evolve based on culture and access to jobs, opportunities around the city. Uh, so a favela in a low-lying area will be very different from a hilly area. Uh, the south zone, the north zone, industrial area, the port area, tourist area. Um, if it was settled in the 20s versus the 80s, they will have very different responses to drug trafficking uh, if they were settled after it began in other parts of the city. So they've tried to solve the problem ahead of time, preemptively. There are so many different kinds of things. The, the type of leadership you had, the quality of leadership um, at different stages in your evolution. Um, and all of those things sort of 
accumulate over time to develop this incredible complexity. A couple of years ago, I was at a conference with uh, David Krakauer of the Santa Fe Institute, and he showed this diagram. And in this diagram, he, he essentially shows that with the level of randomness on the x-axis um, in natural systems, there's an increase in complexity to sort of an ideal in terms of diversity, um, promotion of kind of a, uh, a workable um, level of complexity uh, before it kind of the, the, the chaos or randomness continues to a point where it's uh, counterproductive, you might say, let's say, right? So let's, let's just use this reference. I'm just using this to kind of prod an idea, which I'll show you in a minute. He, he applies the same thing to art to make it more visual, more accessible, right? The idea that that art gets more complex and then it gets sort of chaotic and there's sort of a, a, a peak um, of complexity. Um, and I would argue that if you apply this to human settlements, uh, consolidated functional uh, informal settlements are at that peak. Um, and this is just really not to argue yes or no, it's just to prod us thinking that maybe there's a level of complexity that informal settlements have, and by defining them all as slum around the world, we're completely denying this and the potential and the opportunity that comes out of this reality, um, because we're we're over we're over um, we're, we're too concerned with with the um, com the randomness. I remember Peter's comment yesterday about slumification, how things get more come more. Uh, there's a point where uh, consolidated communities start um, breaking down. Um, you might say that uh, it would be, you know, at an extreme, but it doesn't mean that all informal settlements go that direction. It also means that we should be thinking about if we're building our public housing, uh, that's not public housing, those are called the sacks, but uh, if we build our public housing in a format that's, that deprives um, complexity um, and what that means. And this all ties into the basic framework that underlies our organization's work which is ABCD, asset-based community development. So everything we do with favelas is based on a perspective around assets. We focus on their assets. Um, <clears throat> typical international development, you might say, focuses on community deficiencies. That's what we've been talking about this whole time. We've been talking about the problem of the slum. Um, ABCD focuses on community assets. Typical international development focuses on responding to problems and technical solutions, which I think is what a lot of us have been talking about. Um, but uh, ABCD focuses on identifying opportunities in these communities, like some of the examples that were given yesterday afternoon um, about with settlements that um, uh, in, in the far, in, the, in East Asia, right, where they've painted communities and created tourist, uh, uh, tourism opportunities and different communities developing vocations around their individual uh, opportunities. Um, International development typically has a charitable or favor framework. This is very true in Rio, in Brazilian government, the idea that we're doing a favor to these communities uh, rather than the idea that we're investing in them and we're fulfilling their rights. Um, typical international development talks about experts who provide solutions in a one-way exchange. ABCD is about technical allies working together with residents to come up with mutual solutions that support communities in benefit of the city at large. Um, the Community Land Trust Project in Puerto Rico is an amazing example of this. Um, you know, typical international development provides grants to agencies and ABCD is towards associations and so on. I won't go through the whole list, but basically rather than programs, we're focused on people. Okay? Um, the three core programs of our organization at the moment are Rio One Watch, the Sustainable Favela Network, and the Favela Community Land Trust Project. Um, the idea is to realize, you know, everything we do, again, is asset-based. Um, in the case of Rion Watch, we're responding to the underlying narrative of favelas through our own communications platform. Uh, and everything we do has multiple sort of points of entry. So this isn't just a news site. It's a whole strategy where we work with media uh, from international agencies, community media, and, and other forms um, to change the conversation like I'm doing here today or hoping to do here today about what these communities are and how we should be working with them. Um, our second project, uh, or, or kind of line of work at the moment, is around supporting creative community solutions for sustainable development. We've mapped over 100 community projects across Rio that are all doing uh, resilience and sustainability building in their communities, and we're supporting them. 
And finally, developing and implementing co a comprehensive strategy um, to uh, provide community for community assets. And we really see community land trust as a really serious potential solution for consolidated settlements. Um, so just go quickly through those three programs. Rion Watch started in the build-up to the Olympics when we saw that the narrative that the city was putting out about what they were doing in favelas <clears throat> was very positive. Uh, there were five major programs announced towards favelas from the federal to the local government. Community leaders in our network were incredibly excited about all of these policies. They were very favorable, but once they were implemented, they became very, it became clear that all of them, unfortunately, uh, came minimally counterproductive and often very negative towards communities, including 80,000 forced evictions in that period. So Rion Watch was a site that we produced to basically bring all of these stories to international attention, it's bilingual, um, and make it so that these local community voices could be heard about these big issues. Um, and I should predicate the fact that these communities are stigmatized through movies like City of God, through the media, is why policies can be so counterproductive, right? If we're talking about communities that are living in precarious, horrible, substandard housing, then public housing seems like a great option. Even if for the residents, for the most part, that's actually not as good as the housing they were coming from. But if the public thinks this, then that's going to be the natural conclusion. Same thing with policing. If you think everybody in favelas is a criminal because of things like City of God, you're gonna think that the pacifying police program is good. Um, Janice pointed out the other day that less than 1% of favela residents are involved in drug trafficking. But that statistic doesn't come through. So most people um, think this way. So we collaborated on many projects. I'm not gonna show this now. This is a Vox video about favelas that kind of humanizes them. Um, I recommend folks watch it later. But it's one of many outputs of the Rion Watch program beyond the, our news site, Rion Watch. Our second project, the Sustainable Favela Network, started in 2012 with the UN uh, Conference on the Environment in Rio when we produced a film called Favela as a Sustainable Model, uh, which was a film showing, which was organically developed with community organizers who shared their stories. We went out, filmed them, put together this film, and it shows different elements of favelas that are sustainable. Um, at times by nature, the way they're designed sort of organically, and other times by choice and intention. So we, last year we mapped 100 of these initiatives, um, and we've been supporting their development. We're de developing a sustainable favela indicator for communities to self-organize around. We're doing exchanges, and we're supporting specific communities like Vale Encantado that's developing a biodigester system, which is almost complete, which will fully treat all of the sewage in their small community and become the cleanest sewage in the city of Rio. And finally, the Favela Community Land Trust Project, which is our newest program we've just launched uh, with the help of uh, the Lincoln Institute that supported the, the exchanges and the report that we're, we're pre preparing at the moment um, with the Caño Martín Peña communities in Puerto Rico who came to Rio a few weeks ago and inspired uh, favela organizers and um, officials across the city through a series of workshops. Actually, this is an image on the, the right there, the woman who's screaming. Um, you'll never guess what she's saying. She's in a public meeting saying, I don't want title. We don't want title. In Rio, titles are, some people want them, many people do, but there also is a sizable percentage of favela residents and groups that <clears throat> oppose them because they think it'll increase their cost of living, they'll increase speculation, and they won't be able to stay in their communities that they want to be in um, because in some cases these are historic neighborhoods. Um, so these are pictures of the workshops that we held a few weeks ago. So just to conclude, um, We've been, you know, over the years trying to document our own organization's approach and how we can scale this approach, how we can help others learn from this approach. And uh, basically, you know, at the core of everything we do is locally led community initiatives, supporting local organizers. So we don't, as an NGO, go in and do work um, with uh, community residents directly. Um, we recognize there are solid, serious, excellent community organizers in favelas that are in a much better position to know what community residents want, need, how to support them, how to work with the changing times, uh, how to be productive in any given context because it's changing all the time with the security scenario, with the economy, 
Um, and so we support those organizers who know how to do that kind of work. In fact, that people often ask me, how do you deal with drug traffickers in your work? We've never had to in 18 years, knock on wood. Um, and the reason is we're working with organizers in communities who are modifying their work in accordance with their local conditions at the time. So we have to have this response. Um, and then based on that, we, we have a clear mission, but we're constantly flexible in our strategy. These different programs are responding um, as time changes um, in different ways that are flexible. Uh, we have multiple points of entry, so if we detect that we could work with a partner over here, a community over there, we can work, there's a journalist doing something interesting. Um, we work with all of these different sorts of partners, but we also do our own programming in different ways, some of them smaller, some of them larger, sometimes it's one article, um, in very strategic kind of uh, ways over time, um, and we document all of this. It's very network-based, um, and there's constant reflection going into it. Um, and then, instead of trying to do this in other cities, we're constantly asked, do you do this in Sao Paulo? Do you do this elsewhere? We can't do this in other cities. You can't do this kind of work in many places. You need to focus on the ground. You need to get close. You need to know people. You need to know the communities and the partners and the networks. Um, of course, we work with people in other cities. We share our strategies. We learn from them. That's constantly feeding into our approach and how we're supporting communities, how we're forming links across cities, across the world. Um, we have, Rion Watch has readers from 150 countries a month. So there are people around the world that are learning from these models in Rio, um, and we're learning from them as well. Um, so uh, just wanted to share this, so thank you, um, and I look forward to questions. Thank you, Theresa. Um, now we'll uh, please, uh, Livia, Livia Rodriguez will be the next presenter. And believe me, that is not out of um, um, being um, uh, evil, trying to keep the, the time, uh, um, but it's rather to, to give time for, for the debate. So for the speakers, uh, Emma will be there uh, with a sign with a minute, so just try to make eye contact to see how you're doing with the presentation time. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> These are the ones we copied over today. We didn't copy them earlier. This one? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Gracias. Buenos días. My name is Livia Rodriguez. I come from Puerto Rico, and I have the challenge today of sharing with you. Um, a little bit of the story of eight uh, informal settlements in San Juan uh, that have achieved what many thought was uh, the impossible, which is to become one of the largest property owners, landowners in the San Juan metropolitan area, and in the process get the respect uh, and admiration of everyone. Um, the Caño Martin Peña communities are settled at the heart of the San Juan metropolitan area along a tidal channel, which is what we call a caño. <clears throat> uh, they, as many other informal settlements, they came to San Juan uh, as a result of two hurricanes and a process of industrialization and made the, their sh uh, makeshift homes in what used to be wetlands. That with time uh, got environmentally degraded to the extent that you can literally walk from one side uh, to the next of the caño. Uh, what were the outskirts of the city are now located at the heart of the San Juan metropolitan area. And uh, the issue of environmental degradation coupled with the fact that there is a lack of sewer systems and other basic infrastructure causes a periodical uh, flood that is definitely having an impact in public health uh, for the residents of the Caño. Uh, so uh, in 2001, uh, we engaged together with the residents in a, in a participatory action planning reflection process that took around 700 uh, community uh, activities, community participation activities over the period of two years, and which resulted in two uh, main policy uh, uh, tools. The first one, a comprehensive development and land use plan uh, that is currently adopted by the state 
by the government uh, formally, and secondly, a legislation uh, that created certain instruments that I'm going to talk about. Particularly today, I'm going to focus on a community land trust. And as part of the project, they imagine how can we deal with these environmental distresses that are causing so many problems uh, for the residents. And definitely one piece of that was restoring or is restoring the flow of water uh, between the San Juan Bay and the San Jose Lagoon to the east. Uh, and definitely doing that will then create a real state pressure in this area. So these communities already have a history of evictions and displacements provoked by the government in this particular case in the 50s and 60s. Uh, the, the model cities program that was established in the US was also applied in Puerto Rico, leading to the displacement of more than half of the residents uh, of the community. And then in the same areas where we had the urban poor, the lands that were not uh, safe, for human life, all of a sudden we have other humans living in the very right spot, uh, definitely with a different uh, income levels. Uh, so in this uh, participatory planning process, there was a question and a need of the communities to regularize land tenure. For them, it was very important to have a document uh, that, that represented the, that they had some sort of rights. Uh, so in Puerto Rico, as in many other places, uh, the regularization of property right is in the uh, in the, uh, it's done through individual land titling. Uh, and it has been used uh, politically for uh, the gain of those that are running in, in, in an election. No? Uh, so that is what everybody knew. Everybody was familiar with individual, uh, individual property. Uh, so one of the things that we did was ask the families, why do you need, why do you want to have a property title? And that opened. A, a, a rainbow of, of answers, no? Uh, what was common for everyone is that the community wanted to avoid displacement because these are consolidated communities, almost 100 years old, with a very tight social network and community cohesion. So we presented uh, the communities other forms of tenure, and they evaluated those forms of tenure and realized that there's something called collective land ownership that could actually address the issues why they wanted land titling, but at the same time, uh, help them avoid gentrification and displacement as an unintended result of what is supposed to be an environmental justice project, which is uh, the, the ecological uh, restoration of the Caño Martin Peña. Um, so, in the law that I talked to you about earlier, they managed to include an article that transferred automatically all the government lands that were in the area. Uh, so that uh, that would become the corpus, the original corpus of the Fideicomiso or the Community Land Trust. Um, so it took us after that two years to figure out which lands had been transferred because the registry of uh, the, the information in the government agencies was extremely poor. Uh, and also because many of them did not want to cooperate in the process. Uh, and secondly, for the communities to design how they wanted to manage that new uh, recognized asset, uh, which was uh, the 200 acres of land that were transferred to them. So they decided that they could either rent or lease the land, but also they, uh, they decided that they wanted uh, to, to uh, find a way to recognize individual property rights within a collective uh, uh, land and rights uh, 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 scheme, no? Um, and what I'm going to explain to you right now is uh, what the, the, the way in which the lawyers who came at the end of the process helped them define using the existing property uh, tools available in Puerto Rican uh, legal uh, scheme in Puerto Rico, help them uh, 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 identify which of those tools will make it possible for them to reach their goals. And in this uh, particular community land trust, which has the dual uh, important um, uh, um, purpose of regularizing land tenure and preventing gentrification, what has happened is that uh, there's a dual recognition, first of all, of individual ownership through surface rights. Uh, surface rights are the right to use the plot of land where the individual home is located at. Uh, and these surface rights are presented to the property register, so it, there, there is a formal recognition. They have a monetary value on, on itself. Uh, they can be sold, they can be inherited, which was one of the main uh, purposes of the residents. They can be mortgaged. Uh, the surface rights deeds also recognize the property rights 
uh, for the structure that the inhabitants had built generations ago. And also, it also recognizes that they're collectively owners of the land. Uh, These 200 acres of land in a very strategic location within the San Juan metropolitan area. And the land cannot be sold. It's theirs in perpetuity. Uh, so this uh, ha uh, mechanism has provided also, it's also an instrument that facilitates the implementation of some of the other aspects of the comprehensive development plan, including the relocations process, uh, because uh, the community des decided that some families living in high-risk areas closer to the Caño Martin Peña needed to be relocated, and which families needed to do so. Uh, they created a relocations committee, and we have been going through a relocation process into safe and distant housing within the community whenever the the family chooses to do so. And the land trust has be become a, a, a tool to facilitate that process uh, as well. Um, it, it has also helped the community, for example, establish community gardens and other beneficiary uses in, in vacant lots and so forth. Uh, but I mean, this uh, story is, is, is not a good one without the struggle part, no? Because immediately after the, even before, but immediately after the law was approved, uh, there was a lot of political pressure to take the lands uh, back. And that actually happened in 2009. The government took the lands from the community, and that led to a four-year struggle in the courts, in the streets, everywhere, uh, with a lot of support from the public. And finally, they gained the, the lands back. And here we are, talking about the Fideicomiso de la Tierra. So the important thing about this uh, community land trust is the community aspect of it. Uh, it was designed from the grassroots, from the community. It is an instrument to reach a goal that was previously established by the community and is definitely not a cookie cutter model. That is uh, extremely important because we're dealing with regularization of already existing communities, different from what the traditional community land trust used in Europe or in the United States, for example. Uh, so uh, through this participatory planning action reflection model, the community defined a project that is way wider than the land uh, titling issue, uh, which is called the Proyecto Enlace del Caño Martín Peña. And through the legislation I've talked to you about, three institutions were created. First, uh, the recognition, the formal recognition of the G8, which is a non-for-profit that brings together 12 different grassroots associations. And this is the power of the community coming together uh, with a common agenda. Secondly, the Corporación de Proyecto Enlace, uh, del Caño Martín Peña, which is actually a government corporation that was created with the sole intent to grab the resources of the government, the powers of the government, and put them in the hands of the community. So the community has the majority in that board of directors, and the community decides how to deal with the budget, which projects to do first or last, and they have control over the implementation of the plan, which has been uh, critical throughout the years. And finally, the Community Land Trust, which is also a, 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 a private, uh, non-for-profit organization with perpetual existence, and it has juridical personality so that it can hold the collective land ownership of the land. Uh, but it's also a member uh, organization as well, and we have been working together with the private uh, partners, uh, universities, uh, and the government in, uh, throughout the process uh, when needed. Uh, the Enlace the project has over 30 initiatives um, other than the community land trust. Uh, I won't go into any of them in terms of housing infrastructure, but also uh, I guess that the most important pa part is to promote critical thinking, organizing, participation, is, which is uh, the, the main aspect, uh, the main driving force, regardless of what happens to the other elements of the project. We'll have active citizens empowered and deciding and doing uh, the, the work that they have to do, but also recognizing that the state has a role, that they have rights, and making sure that they have a say at the table. Um, Hurricane Maria, last year, uh, actually a year ago, uh, the 20th of September, it was devastating for Puerto Rico. It was definitely devastating for our communities as well. Uh, but it proved the capacity that the community has gained throughout the past 17 years and how these institutions work together to do the impossible. I mean, like uh, it, nobody died because of the hurricane in the Caño Martin Peña communities. It was amazing to see that. And, and it was precisely the direct result of a strong community-based organizing. Um, so just to, to finish, uh, 
I, I think that using community land trusts in, uh, for regularization purposes, uh, from our perspective, needs several ingredients. Uh, first of all, uh, it in our case, it was a consolidated community with uh, the most important part, which is a strong community cohesion, uh, organizing, a strong grassroots organizing, but also support organizations to help them facilitate the hard discussions that need to be had and to facilitate uh, those uh, uh, conflicts in, in a positive way to provoke and to expose uh, people to different ways of doing things and approaches, but where the families and the residents are the ones ones that make the decisions and not the community leaders, not the people from outside, but rather the residents themselves. The other aspect is uh, uh, that we feel is important is that in the case of the Caño, there was a real threat of displacement. And in a context in which individual property is God, you know, a, a having or proposing collective land ownership was something nobody else could understand. Uh, um, so that uh, threat of displacement was critical for the communities to make make this uh, decision. And finally, they had the real possibility of getting the land, not because the government wanted to give it to them, but because uh, there was a path forward that they pursued and that they uh, struggled for. Um, so I would say that, again, the Fideicomiso is an instrument. It's not an end for itself. Uh, the advisors here uh, the legal advisors in particular, they came at the end of the process, as I said earlier, and I think that that is one of the largest lessons learned in, in the same way we did this, for example, with the legal aspects of the project, the same thing happened in terms of uh, other uh, tools that were taken from the regulatory scope of Puerto Rico that were not designed uh, for informal settlements. However, they were used to make the agenda of the community be able to move forward. And sometimes it has brought, you know, a little bit of difficulties in the implementation as well, uh, but because those instruments were not created for this purpose. However, uh, in the end, uh, they, it has become a very uh, important strategy uh, to, to be able to use those instruments. Um, and uh, I just uh, wanted to end that uh, the, uh, I, I came here uh, to work with these communities since the beginning of the process in 2001. I think that the fact that there has been a continuous effort uh, has been critical. Uh, that it was not a group of people doing planning and working on planning and then leaving and then someone else trying to do something. No, it has been a continuous uh, process uh, in which taking the time to reflect on where what we're doing wrong and learning from that uh, has been as important as any other aspect of what has been created. So for me, it's definitely an honor to be here and having uh, the opportunity and the privilege to talk about a story that has really touched me uh, deeply. Thank you so much. Wonderful presentation and project and initiative. Um, congratulations also and to you and to the community for the incredible effort and success so far. And uh, now we're going to have Fernando de Melo, who, by the way, I said that wrong, he was the former Secretary of Urban Development in Sao Paulo, and also for some of you, the architects, also former partner of the MMBB Architecture Office in Sao Paulo. Fernando. Good morning, thank you very much for the invitation. I will tell you about one pilot project, almost a trial, uh, uh, concerned about structuring a formal social rental market uh, in Sao Paulo and in Brazil. Uh, first of all, as so many of you said yesterday, probably the problem of uh, the solution for favelas are not within the borders of the favelas, but outside it. And this picture uh, has two years by now. It's a new uh, occupation at the fronts of the metropolitan area of Sao Paulo. And in spite of the fact the population, the demographic growth 
is going to zero in Brazil, uh, especially in the great metropolis, we still have new waves of uh, informal urbanization, which says that, which means that uh, probably the cause of this is the fact that inequality is growing, segregation is growing, gentrification is growing, and uh, the impossibility of accessing land within the city is one of the main uh, problems. Well, let's get the context, the picture. Uh, the land ownership concentration in Sao Paulo is extremely obscene. You can see that 1% of the population, of the property owners, as a matter of, uh, a matter of fact, own 45% of the property share. In Sao Paulo, we have more than 500,000 uh, vacant dwellings when the social housing deficit is a little bit more than 600,000, which means that we could solve the problem in just a few minutes if you want to. <laughs> and we also have 38 million uh, informal workers, which means 40, a little bit more than 40% of the productive population of the, the country. Uh, so maybe this, uh, this number, this 38 million, could be the focus of an efficient uh, public policy. So we have two questions to, 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 to address you right now. Uh, first, and how to increase qualified dwelling offer. And second, is how to insert no income proof workers in the formal rental market. As a matter of fact, this picture is not to show you what inequality is about uh, in Brazil, but to show you uh, how much spoiled land we have within ur already urbanized and consolidated areas of the city. This is also a new invasion in an extremely well-located located, located, uh, context uh, in Sao Paulo. Uh, that has been occupied by one of the social movements which asserts uh, land like this uh, in order to give a solution for the huge amount of people who are uh, willing for a decent uh, housing. So what the municipality of Sao Paulo did two years ago, uh, our Constitution says that every single one has the right of own a property, which is okay, of course, but also says that every single property has to accomplish a social function. So we have uh, at the federal level the tools for dealing with this uh, condition, but only few municipalities use and implement those tools. One of them was Sao Paulo, who implemented a large program of uh, dealing with the social function of property with this PILC uh, instrument. I'm not going to explain this, but if you don't provide a new use for your land, you will have a progress urban property tax uh, over time, which means that in five years, the tax can be about 15%. And if you reach this point, the municipality can expropriate, not expropriate, but to buy your land, pay with uh, public debt titles, which is not a good deal. So, uh, since uh, 2014, uh, in the first two years of the implementation of this tool, the municipality already notified more than 1,000 properties, which uh, altogether provides 2,5 million square meters in ZEIS. ZEIS is another tool which uh, is a special zone of social interest which is uh, a zoning uh, 
uh, instrument that provides uh, uh, a land stock for social housing production in the city. So only in two years we could find this huge amount of land and also built area that could be used for uh, offer new dwellings. Well, uh, we also have, uh, let me say so, a strong uh, ecosystem of social uh, impact investments, business uh, in Brazil, especially in Sao Paulo. And they are trying to, to, to address answers to uh, all kinds of social problems. One of them is uh, providing uh, titles, not providing titles, but um, facilitating uh, the, the, the title uh, process. Uh, and this is important because the, the, the government does uh, regularization, but doesn't do uh, at the same speed as uh, the community needs. And uh, social business, social impact business uh, can accelerate and help uh, the government in this process. Second, we have now new uh, business focused on uh, upgrading uh, dwellings, which is extremely important because uh, basically what we have in terms of social policies, social housing policies in Brazil is about producing new units, but we have so many people already uh, living someplace, especially favelas, and they need just a sharp money uh, in order to uh, provide conditions to improve the places they live. So those companies, they, they sell kits, uh, really affordable kits, uh, that can allow the population to improve uh, their homes. But also, uh, one of the goals is to empower uh, the construction productive chain uh, within the, the favelas they are uh, working at the moment. And finally, and third, we, we are developing um, a new uh, platform, a kind of broker platform, that basically is aiming to provide conditions for uh, no uh, income proof workers to, to get access to a better and cheaper uh, rental uh, condition. Because when you don't have uh, how to prove your income, you pay much more than you should. And this is a fact. So it's really important to provide conditions for these people to the 38 million workers that have income but cannot prove they have income to access a better condition of rental uh, policies. And why rental and not producing units? Because, well, we have a huge crisis at the moment. There is no more money for doing social housing. And as a matter of fact, Minha Casa Minha Vida is also not the solution of this problem. So let's try how to empower a rental system. And just to finish, so what we see is that we have, those are just a few examples, a huge constellation of actors acting uh, and trying to provide solutions for this. And our hypothesis is how to link and how to uh, integrate uh, those uh, social impact business with social housing policies. And connect the dots was a methodology, let me say, so a strategy that we developed uh, during our political term uh, that was quite successful on the strengthening of the local familiar agricultural productive chain. So uh, we might be able to mitigate this really uh, gigantesque problem uh, articulating all the dots that belong to the same uh, chain 
And that way, combining efforts between the public and the private in order to address a kind of answer for this. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation, Fernando. Last but not least, we're going to have Michael Uemedimo, who is the, the project director of CMAP, the Collaborative Media Advocacy Platform. Um, super excited to be here and, and bewildered. Uh, it's been a really rich uh, couple of days. So I just want to um, start by giving you a, a little concrete context about Port Harcourt, which is where uh, we live and work. Uh, it's the oil capital of Nigeria. It's in the Niger Delta, which, as you know, is an area that for 500 years has been part of a globalized economy. Uh, one edge of a black Atlantic across which has traveled dark cargo for, for centuries. First human beings, then palm oil, then coal, and now crude oil. And it's difficult to understand how the region is structured unless you understand the, the process of hydrocarbon extraction. This is a map of the region, ostensibly drawn by a newly independent Nigerian government, uh, the, the Office of the Geological Survey in 1962. But if you look at the legend on the other side, you'll see that it's compiled by air and ground photos by Shell BP. So the, the map of the region was literally drawn by Shell. And the impacts of, of the oil and gas industry have been, have been profound. At a conservative estimate, 10% of all production is informal. That's the equivalent of the total national production of Ghana in 2013, 150,000 barrels a day. There are hundreds of these uh, informal uh, artisanal refineries, but 75% of all the product is sold in the formal system on the open market. So again, the, the distinction between the, the formal and, and the informal um, is, uh, is involved. The impacts have been, have been profound, and they have distorted the, the physical space, but also the, the imaginary. Uh, you have the, the reality of, of the urban form, and then you have this kind of perverse uh, pastoral petro-utopia, which is, <laughs> is uh, you know, how, how the government imagines the place should be or, or will be. And that has profound effects for the people that, that live there. Uh, in Port Harcourt, this city in the creeks, nearly half a million people live in, in densely settled informal uh, waterfronts. And even though this is the core urban condition, there is no state presence. There's no municipal provision of any kind. And so you see the kinds of, uh, uh, of space that you associate with, uh, with slums properly. Uh, this is the, the, the city abattoir. Sanitation issues, this is just in front of our, our project site. Massive insecurity, prejudicial policing, and of course stark inequality. In 2009, all of these areas were declared for, for demolition. Um, I, I won't show you this video now, but um, it's, it's harsh. It just, it, the, there's an overwhelming uh, immediacy to, to the violence. There's a kind of uh, militarization of, of urban design. And the human impacts are, are profound. Um, CORE estimated that two million people had been displaced in Nigeria in a single decade. So, you know, you, you look at the scenes and 
they look like they're post-natural disaster scenes, right? post-tsunami, post-earthquake. But here, the disaster is a result of, of policy implementation. OK, so that's, that's the context. Uh, how, how do we respond? I think yesterday, Edgar uh, spoke about what if. And, and for us, it's a move from what if to as if. You need to behave as if. You need to proceed as if, because otherwise what? And the, the core of the project to these people, just to let people in, it's called the Human City Project, to, to remain rooted at the level of, of the community, but to have an impact at the level of, of the city, to move from a process of, of social and spatial exclusion to one of participatory development, to move from opposition to proposition, to be in a position where we're able to to give voice to the vision of the urban majority who are physically shaping the face of the city, but who are totally excluded from, from formal decision-making processes. And when we, we spoke to people about what was important, all of them said they lacked a voice. And when we started thinking about what it might mean to develop platforms for community voice in this context, people came back with a very literal response. They said they wanted a radio station. They wanted to be able to speak out. So Chicoco Radio was, was the, the start of the project. Chicoco is the name of the mud that these, these settlements are, are built on. And when we were thinking about developing a radio station, that introduced an architectural component. We needed a house for that voice. And so then we started thinking about developing Chicoco Space, this, this media center. And it became apparent that we mustn't fetishize a building. Right? From, the, from, from the beginning, we, we, need to, we need to think about how to relate the building to the site, the site to the neighborhood, the neighborhood to the city. And so we developed a participatory mapping and planning program to, to get these uh, connections, these linkages, these systems uh, activated in the community. And to use that information and these networks to develop a series of community-led pilot projects, drainage projects, sanitation projects, that the communities could, could lead on with, with small technical support. And that all was to be the foundation of what we call the people's plan, because people were conspicuously absent from, from the master's plan. And all of that to be supported by, uh, by campaigning. So we, we have grand plans, but we wanted to, to start small. We started uh, with what we call the, the media shed, uh, which is a shed, uh, which is a light at night, solar powered. And it's the home of our, uh, our first radio training studio, now our, our music studio. It's also the town hall. Um, uh, another element of the project is, is Chicago Cinema. At the beginning of this project, I found myself with a camera in the middle of an enormous force eviction in which 19,000 people lost their homes in a single weekend. And something quite surprising happened. So as people's homes were being destroyed, so they had, they had concerns, right? They had things to, uh, to keep them busy. They saw my camera and they started directing me, saying, film this, film that. And when I was arrested that day, they, they took the camera, they smuggled it away, and got it back to me. And I cut together a little film, sent it to Amnesty International, who used it as part of their Demand Dignity campaign, which is a global campaign, and sent it back with their logo on it. And we took it around on a small screen, and something happened. People recognized themselves, I mean, sometimes literally, but more importantly, they recognized themselves as recognized. That was the, the, the animating impulse. So we, we decided to uh, add a little theatre to the cinema. So we got this big blow-up cinema. Um, and the community that you see on the screen there is the community that the screen is in. So this idea of, of, of people framing their own, own image really drives the project, trying to look at ways of layering different different processes of representation, cinematic representation, radiographic representation, legal representation, have a strategic litigation program, to allow people to change the way in which the city is imagined, planned, built, and, and inhabited. 
It's a great way of, of, of focusing people, animating them. Um, we have uh, a very active uh, platform for community voice. We have a, a music program, a, a radio program, and um, it's, it's a shame. Usually when I present, I, I play songs and, and, and show films because that's the only way really to, 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 to communicate the, the power of it. I'll, I'll play a 43 second clip at the end, but just to, to, to move on to other spaces of representation, the street is very important. To, to find a way to make the urban majority visible, to change the, the, the energy of, of the streets through, through campaigning. And um, to find a way to allow these, these visions to be, to be spatialized as well is key. I shall stop in 30 seconds. Um, uh, so just, just to show you some images from, from our participatory mapping program, because I think this is important, that this, we have really high quality data. We, we know more about these informal parts of the city than are known about any part of the city. And because of this, because uh, we demonstrably have the power to, to engage and research, uh, the World Bank, we, we responded to a, a request for proposals in a technical assistance program for uh, glamorously named Fecal Sludge Management Services in, in Port Harcourt. And um, uh, we, our community team won the bid, so we now know a lot about shit in Port Harcourt. But the, 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 the point is that this community team is recognised uh, by the World Bank as having the capacity to, to produce high quality data. Um, finally, uh, we, we want to uh, consolidate all our, our different facilities into a, to bring them together into a, a, a single building, which is being designed through a participatory process, and which I hope will be uh, ongoing, uh, and I hope to make some connections here with, with, with designers. Um, it's, it's a very open and, and, and inclusive process. And before we started thinking about spatial design, we asked people what values they wanted the building to embody, what histories they wanted it to explore, what futures they wanted it to gesture towards. And only then did we go on to, to talking about utility services functions and, and voting for what it should, should provide. And that, that got us to, to this design which I think exemplifies one of the core dynamics of the project, which is to try and set up a catalytic relationship between the co-production of open public discourse and the co-production of open public space. So here you have the radio studios, a space of open public debate, which creates an open public space. So just to, to uh, leave you with this little jingle, um, Hang on. It's a floating station. Yeah. Over the waters. Yeah. Check a clean sound. No yeah. water sound. Yeah. We rock the city. Oh. We map the city. Ooh. Check a cinema. Press the water from people. Can you hear a voice? Loud and a bullet. Brought us from the sky. Should, how much time do we have? Half an hour?
20, 20 minutes? Yeah, no, I just want to. Okay. No, thank you, guys. That was really good. It kind of also changes the, 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 the discussion, in a sense, because it's all sort of um, projective. I'm going to just ask for a couple of questions, and actually more as clarifications to add on, because everyone had limited time, and then we can open it up to the, uh, to the audience. So, so Teresa, I want to sort of uh, start with you know, your last diagram, and you kind of fleetingly touched upon this, which is that scale by example. And you had these arrows that were flying out of your circle. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, I think that's really important. I just wanted you to perhaps share with us one or two examples of those interactions, because, I mean, I think what you seem to imply was a back and forth flow. So it was also a learning from and not just an aspiration to scale up, but to begin to. And I, I, you know, I think the point that you made about the specificity, the nuances of differences, I mean, I think, you know, if you just deconstruct that word slum, I don't think, I mean, nationally they're different. I always argue that Mumbai, uh, for example, in India, slums are centers of production, actually. Uh, and in other parts of the world, they're not. And I think within cities, there are incredible nuances of, of these settlements. Let's sort of use that kind of broader word. Uh, so I just was very curious how and what, what is the nature of those flows that that might uh, come back. Uh, so that was sort of uh, one question. And I think to you, I, I, to Livia, I, you know, you had a, the last point you had in the, in the slide of, maybe it was the last slide, was, was crucibles for, for, co for production. Uh, I wrote that down somewhere, I'm sorry. Uh, the, yes, you had that as for micro, micro business um, uh, uh, incubators. So I just, you know, because that, the idea again of production and places like this that are producers, uh, I think was implied there, but you didn't sort of elaborate that. Um, and uh, Fernando, I, you know, clearly what, what's interesting is that uh, I think in the first two arguments, not that Teresa and Livia they are not aware of the bigger picture, but it's very much a grassroots bottom up kind of swelling of capacity building of aspirations being met. And then I think you suddenly showed us something that's clearly top down in some ways. Again, not not that you're not aware of the micro picture, and that's not implied at all, but it's a different beginning of the process no? to see uh, 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 this. And so is that because of the critical mass of the problem? What are your reflections on that uh, that made you enter uh, the problem in that way? And Michael, for you, just a, a question in, in an interesting way, your kind of presentation straddles these scales in that, that beautiful diagram of the circle. And But the one kind of question you didn't touch upon, which I'm just curious about, is the interface then with government and authority? Because yes, this is, you're almost bypassing them in this implication. And so is there a moment there where that contact is made? So whoever wants to start with it. Oh, why don't you start, Mike? Okay. I, well, um, <clears throat> it's, it's, been a, it's been a long process. So the relationship with the authorities uh, has changed. I, I think at the beginning, it was a, a case of um, trying very urgently and immediately just to create a, a resistance, um, sometimes a physical resistance, to to, to try and, and and stem this 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 force of overwhelming violence. Then we wanted to go under the radar for a moment. We we wanted to create a safe space because. It's, it's a predatory state. I mean, this, this is a thing. What, what uh, Fernando presented is not possible now in Nigeria. One of the things we're working towards to try and create the conditions of possibility for that kind of approach, that kind of connection. At the moment, it's not possible. So in the first instance, we wanted to, to just hunker down and, and, and get strong. But we also realized that it would... As I said, it's, it's very important to move from opposition to proposition. We needed to, to uh, demonstrate that we have a vision that's not only desirable but achievable, that's, that's feasible. Um, we now have technical cooperation agreements with the Ministry of Urban Development, Ministry of Water Resources, Ministry of Housing. Um, and uh, we're working with Cities Alliance to... Uh, develop their country program and to use this project as the proof point and launch pad for a, a, a country program. 
and also with, with Cities Alliance and UNDP, um, we're just developing a GEF project, Global Environment Facility Project, which will put in infrastructure uh, at scale. I mean, not, not yet citywide, but infrastructure at scale that can still be community managed, but is network scalable to the level of the city. So when you're thinking about how to scale, you're not just thinking about getting really big, you're thinking about creating approaches and platforms which can be connected and then, and then have impact at the city level. So, so basically now we're trying to, to um, open a space for the government to, to engage. Well, in such a big country like Brazil with 200 million inhabitants, scale matters. <laughs> and if we don't think in terms of scale, probably will not address any, anything. Uh, but I think top-down actions or bottom-up actions alone makes no, no difference. And my point is uh, we should find the contact point between both uh, directions where we can find friction on both. And we have so many bottle-up initiatives in Brazil, we always had, and these maybe uh, are being even more strong. But although we have a really short hope in terms of politics in Brazil by now, I think the only hope we can have is through politics. And, uh, we have to uh, design good public policies. And the question for me is how to articulate politics, policies, and also the polity uh, in order to, to make the move and make the change. Yes, regarding the micro business incubator, uh, as uh, the settlements that have been described very well, the Caño Martin Peña also has a very vibrant uh, business environment, uh, a, a lot of informal businesses and self employment as well. Um, so, what we have done is uh, uh, assist uh, persons that are wanting to uh, create uh, new uh, businesses or that have already existing businesses but want uh, to expand the range uh, of action. And in some cases that think that they, by becoming formal, they can actually uh, grow. Uh, so we help them through that process. Uh, it's a, a proceso de acompañamiento, I don't know how, how to say that. In, in the right way in English. But uh, uh, some of the businesses that have been incubated have to do with uh, precisely uh, 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 community tourism. We have two of those. Um, construction, uh, for example, and other services. Uh, some of them are social businesses that the community organization uses to uh, generate funding so that they can actually implement some of their projects and programs as well. Um, just wanted to tell a little story. When I first got uh, to Rio and I started visiting favelas, um, there were a number of movements, um, uh, community organizing groups that I, I was working with closely. And the first year was literally just going to meetings um, and listening. Um, fortunately, this was part of my doctoral dissertation, so I had the opportunity to do that. I don't think most people starting an NGO get to do that. And the NGO ended up becoming the topic of my dissertation, so it, again, allowed me to develop something more reflective as I developed uh, catalytic communities uh, shortly after with our team. Um, but one group, this group, uh, they constantly referred to themselves um, as scalded cats. Um, and they referred to this in relation to government, they referred to this in relation to NGOs. They referred to this in relation to academia. Uh, basically, anybody. Um, something simple, like we might think of an NGO image of, of somebody living in poverty and think, oh, they're raising money to do good work. Um, what, if, what does that mean to the individual who's in that image? What about the community they're from? Um, that's how they're being reflected to the world. That to them may feel, often in the case of the communities I wor work with, feels like exploitation, not support. Um, the fact that we're looking at them through this negative lens uh, 
it, it, it's, it's a form of exploitation. Um, and I was sensitized to this immediately. Um, and so when I was developing catalytic communities, I was trying to figure out how I, how I could support communities and these organizers who I saw were doing really good work, who I do believe are developing solutions, but they're small scale. How do you support these local grassroots small scale solutions, which all of us are capable of in our communities? Uh, you know, if the whole world could do that, we would be in a very different boat. Um, so I do believe in top-down, you know, uh, large-scale policy decisions. I think um, they're essential. But I, I ultimately think that we won't get anywhere if we don't get people involved and recognize their involvement. So just getting to the question, um, so, so we had to develop an organization that was going to support these communities in a way that um, allowed that, that, that they felt supported, that they felt was relevant and useful. Um, and that one interesting element is we had to stay small. Um, large organizations are seen uh, skeptically. Um, if you raise a lot of money uh, and you do a project and you move on to a different project because the money's gone, communities see that as, as well, we're, we're still here. The community organizers who are our audience of who we support, they, they're there every day for free doing this work. If somebody from outside is only there because they're making money or perceived to be making money, even if it's not a great salary by any of our standards, it's a great salary by their standards, um, to them that's also a form of exploitation. The, the level of sense of exploitation in these communities is tremendous. You know, just thinking about the last five, and, so I've been doing this work 18 years. The first eight or nine years, the dominant sense was we want government services. Then 2008, 9, 10, we had the PAC, Federal Ex Growth Acceleration Program, coming in with investments in favelas. We had the Morac Carioca Program that was supposed to upgrade favelas. We had the Pacifying Police Program, who, by the way, in our 2010 course, social media training, everybody wanted in their favelas. So communities wanted these. They had been hoping for programs like these for decades. Um, and then once they were implemented, they were left with a sense of, we don't want the government. I mean, so it's really gotten to a point where that's the level of lack of trust. So anyway, um, so we've had to develop this sort of strategy to do what we do. Um, and in terms of the scaling and the examples of how, how that happens, they, it's, it's, it's just a, it's constant because it's really about sharing and inspiring. It's not about replication. So um, the model I just shared is really a model based on favelas. How do they organize? How do you do a lot with little? How do you do a lot with networks? How do you use multiple points of entry and not necessarily? How do you be flexible because the, the changes are things are changing, how do you deal with things and solve things in those conditions? And that's essentially what we're doing. So we learned from favelas, in, and that, the model's really based on how favelas organize. Um, and then, you know, examples, um, you know, our social media trainings that we did in 2010 for community organizers, they were, they were then, communities then took all that knowledge back into their communities. Uh, some created their own trainings. Um, we had our community center, which I didn't show today, but we for five years we ran a community center in downtown Rio that provided networking support to 1,200 different community leaders. Um, that was, you know, uh, the UN uh, you included that in there in UN Habitat's actionable ideas um, and and kind of uh, shared that around the world. We don't know exactly the results of that. Um, the Rion Watch project is studied by community organizers in LA with the LA Olympics. We've talked to them a lot about media strategies. Um, groups in Kenya that we've talked about with uh, about media strategies, sharing strategies, community leaders in Rio and organizers who use those media strategies. And again, we learn from them. So it's really hard yeah. to pinpoint specifics, yeah. but yeah. it's... But that's the, kind yeah. of a, the approach again. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's open this up. So we've... Oh, there are lots of hands. Wow. Okay. Uh, we're going to start here with Francisco. Good morning. I have uh, two questions. One is for Livia and the other one for Teresa. Uh, the one for Livia is the follow. Um, you presented a case which is uh, frequent, and we mentioned this in past uh, <coughs> meetings, uh, which is the case of uh, uh, slums being in the center of the city or in very, very central positions. And you presented also a, a solution which uh, is really new and appealing, 
But it, it, for me, it creates uh, one problem. I, want, I would like to know what you think about this. And it's the fact that uh, being in that position, there is uh, in these uh, terrains uh, an increase of the value of the land. So by, in, by blocking the possibility to sell the, 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 this land, you are differentiating two kinds of uh, uh, citizens, the ones that live outside who have the possibility to enjoy of the increase of the rent of the land, and the ones to live inside that are not allowed to enjoy of this uh, rent. So this is my question for, for Libya. And for uh, Teresa, my question is uh, that um, I felt that you um, are, um, in a way, celebrating the favela and uh, uh, as a model for, even as a model for the city, for uh, how to really uh, a better city could be. And I asked myself, and I, I asked to you, why do you think that wealthy cities, like, for instance, Cambridge or others, uh, do not prefer the scheme of the favela? Yes, yes. Should we, should we collect uh, several questions, perhaps, oh, given that there are yeah, many hands? Yeah, okay, let's collect one or two more. Sorry, okay. there's Edgar there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. We've got only five Thanks minutes. Thanks to the panelists. That was really fantastic and um, very provocative. So I'd like to um, connect the four presentations to the discussion yesterday that Sheila kicked off and... Uh, the, so I'm really interested in how we, if we can think more explicitly and precisely about the organizational modalities of mobilizing in these, uh, and to reflect on your deep experience. So um, I guess the question that I have is that for a very long time, SDI has been very hegemonic in projecting what the model is for organizing in these communities in terms of federating and the associated ideological practice to underpin that and so on. And of course, Sheila evoked that yesterday and can speak very eloquently about that. Um, but these seem to be, there's parallels, but they are very different models. And I think it might be useful for our collective discussion to be more explicit about what are these similarities and differences and what's the implications of it. The second question is how do you manage the political? So in terms of not just the state, but political parties who in the context of these cities often have to be deeply embedded in everyday life and cultural practices and institutional dynamics and deals and negotiations. And what do you do with that when the larger body politic, as Fernando has explained, has become as toxic as it is at the moment? And then I guess finally is what then is the mechanisms that you've deployed in your practice to do that very fine calibration of strategic choice, right? So when you've got to go this way or that way, and there's, you know, the professional knowledge and the, you know, so there's still for me quite a vague discussion about the community and collective practice. And it'd be lovely, I think, in this context to hear a little bit more about the complexity of managing those power relations between the professional bodies and the, and the grassroots organizations. Thanks. So I think that's like heavy enough. So we should, <laughs> uh, we should go for these responses and we'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, so Edgar's question is uh, whoever wants to take that or not take that. And then I think we had some specific ones from Francesco. So maybe you guys should respond to that first. And yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I, I don't think that the premise is uh, in terms of uh, that uh, something like the community land trust will actually curtail the capacity of the residents to enjoy rent. Because what is going on is what was going on prior to the community land trust and still in those areas that are not uh, participating in the community land trust uh, is that they're being bought out. And they're being bought out at very low prices. You know? And what's going to happen once the, uh, uh, the project that is being planned for decades takes place is that the land value will, cut, will finish them up. It's, they're not going to last a decade. Uh, and that's the type of things that we've been, been seeing uh, time and time again in San Juan and, and, and elsewhere. So yeah. this actually is, is an instrument to avoid that and to, uh, to have them being able to uh, stay in the area that se chuparon el hueso, como dice en español, that they have had such uh, difficulties over time to reach a, a better livelihood uh, that is the best location perhaps in the city uh, and 
otherwise they will have uh, receive a very small amount of money and they will have to go uh, very far out uh, in, in other areas that do not have the same amenities. Uh, the other thing though is that the community land trust owns land that is uh, vacant. And some of that land is actually located in the middle of the Golden Mile, which is the financial district. So there is an opportunity that the community has been using to rent that land uh, and to use the, those funds to uh, engage in other practices uh, uh, projects within the community. And actually there's a possibility of doing turnkey developments and other sorts of uh, use of the land uh, in as much it is uh, in accordance with what the community needs and their plan. Um, yeah, no, I see that the, the argument can come across that way. Um, it's important to, to note that we are working from an asset-based perspective, so we're immersed in the assets and the qualities. And I didn't show these slides, but there are sociocultural assets, urbanistic economic assets that are, um, you could argue, not in a difficult way, that they are better, that they are not better, um, but that they are uh, favorable in relation to the formal city, certainly in Rio. Um, and, and I think anybody who lives in Rio or has been to Rio recognizes that the culture that, the, the culture that people associate with the city is primarily favela origin, right? Um, uh, the way of life of the city is very influenced. So it, it's, it's not, it, I do think that there's a lot for formal cities, developed cities to learn, I think. All of us would probably argue, and I said this a couple days ago, but not everyone was there, that um, we prefer to be informal in our everyday lives, don't we? Uh, what do we do on the weekend normally? We, we're not here normally on the weekend. What do we do? Casual Fridays, right? I think there are a lot of double standards. You know, Tactical urbanism is this big new wave of trend You know, with uh, people taking over, you know, putting in sidewalks where, or street uh, uh, crosswalks where they think they should be um, and taking over parking spaces with green space. Favelas are tactical urbanism, but they're not recognized um, in a positive way at all, right? Um, maker spaces, uh, hacking uh, solutions. Um, there's an indigenous term in Portuguese for that, uh, and gambiaja, and, and people don't uh, parade, you know, don't talk about that in the same favorable light. There's now a trend towards dangerous playgrounds in the global north. Um, to you know, get your kids out there risking themselves because it's good for them. Um, when people go to favelas and kids are exploring their environment, uh, they don't see it that way. I'm not romanticizing, it's just there's a huge double standard and I think we bring our preconceived notions and our prejudices. Um, you know, I would prefer to spend a weekend afternoon in a favela than most places I know in the formal city. And I'm not romanticizing. It's just, it's a, a very different way of life. Um, and, and I think that in some, I think to some extent, people in Rio, again, these are context specific cases. I, I think some people actually are jealous of people in favelas. I think there are people in the formal city who see people in favelas and, and, and there are elements of their lives that they would like to be able to repeat. Not the violence not the poor sewage, sanitation, education, health, but those are government neglect issues. Um, they're not endemic to favelas, uh, you know, and so I, I think there's a lot of learning we need to do. I think that the global, you know, northern cities could benefit from more informality, more opportunities for spontaneity, um, and, and so I, I think we need to blur some of these edges and start, you know, changing our lenses so that we see a little bit more um, Clearly. Edgar, I mean, it really important questions which kind of immediately concern us. I mean, I would, I would love to find ways to be able to actively collaborate with SDI, which didn't involve having to follow certain rituals, for example. Um, because maybe these are not, maybe it, these rituals aren't suited to this particular cultural context or space. Um, it would be great to find more creative, collaborative and flexible ways um, of, of networking and organizing together. And in Nigeria at least, or in, in Port Harcourt at least, which is my, my concrete context, that possibility doesn't necessarily present itself, where there's quite a kind of sometimes predatory or territorial kind of 
of, of relationship and it would be nice to find ways um, I think it's important to find ways of, of moving moving beyond that because I also think it would make uh, the federated model uh, more powerful um, because more diverse um, and we, we recognize that um, community is not an innocent construct right? that, that it's 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 structured by many uh, forms of exclusion and, and, and repression and and uh, we are while uh, sensitive to established community representatives uh, somewhat um, suspicious of representatives we prefer to deal with people and and are trying to open a space in which people can uh, can enter and explore and experiment with different kinds of identities. So we have, we have on the, the community leadership, we have a woman's leader, you know, very important person, the woman's leader. But try being a young woman as opposed to like the community sanctioned, um, you know, or a, a young queer woman. Or, um, so so how, how to, to, to find a space where people can, can collaborate and develop a collectivity, a creative collectivity. Um, these, these are critical questions and, and I think answered only through the doing, um, through, and, and through reflection, through a praxis. Um, and, and there will be many answers and they will all be particular. Mm -hmm. Alan, you want you, anyone else wants to respond to Edgar's question? Yeah, I I think that's a very pertinent question. You asked many different things, so I'm just gonna tackle a couple of them. Uh, in terms of how to manage political parties, I guess that the story I talked to you about regarding the land being taken off and then the community regaining it had precisely to do with the fact that the community was messing with the political uh, 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 pretensions, no? Uh, uh, and they and basically what they did was take power out of a mayor uh, because they couldn't use any more land titling as a as a ship, a trading ship uh, for for those purposes. But definitely, uh, partisan politics have been at the core of organizing for a very long time. And what this process has led to is for the communities to establish an agenda separate from one of the political parties. And leaders are working together despite of their political affiliations, which in a particular particular contest is almost miraculous uh, and uh, and uh, and actually every four years there's elections so nowadays they sit with all the candidates for governor of Puerto Rico for mayor of San Juan for the legislature and all of them sign a written contract with the community uh, after the conversation is over they they make uh, some agreements and the community has a local newspaper that is published by the G8, so they publish whether the politicians are complying or not with whatever they said they were going to do. So those are different ways in which uh, uh, start, you know, balancing out uh, these uh, structures. Uh, in terms of the models of organizing, again, uh, uh, I don't think these are co uh, cookie cutter models, but rather tools, and in, uh, that that people can use in different situations because the context and the situations are so varied. Uh, but what for us is important is, is that uh, those persons that are in that sit I mean, our project has a, a, a community participation office. Uh, basically, the staff there are com community social workers. Um, and their work is basically to facilitate the processes. It's not to make decisions for the community. It's actually to provoke conversations, difficult conversations, dialogos de saberes, eh, and to make sure that in the end, the decisions are taken by the residents, not eh, by other structures of power, and then eh, work together with community leaders who have a very important role, so that they also assume a democratic style of leadership. Anyone else to, uh, yeah? Okay, because we we're really out of time, I'm, I'm sorry. And you know, the next panel, uh, I mean, I think the issues are kind of gonna carry over. And so we could even go back to some of these panelists and the questions, I promise you that. And that's what the Phil uh, Fishbowl is about. But I just wanna with, close this by you know, saying a couple of things which I hope will, will, will raise some issues, especially for the fishbowl, because some of these are complicated and we need to kind of uh, uh, you know, pick them. And I just, that, that exchange that you guys just had, for me was very interesting. And, and I almost sort of, I, you know, I, actually the way I would frame it, uh, Teresa and Francesco, is that 
maybe not double standards. It's actually, this is the problem with the binaries that we set mm -hmm. up and that we live in them. And then we, are, we become architects and planners who work in one of the other worlds. And I mean, I think the tension that even Ranjini showed us with the drone images versus uh, Slumdog Millionaire, I think this tension is something that we have to really, so it's really about the simultaneous validity of these conditions, because I think we can learn across them. And, mm -hmm. and, and how we frame that even in pedagogy, et cetera, is going to become a real, it, that is the challenge. Challenge. And I think, so it's, a, it's an interesting uh, point. And I think that also takes me to another question, which is related, again, going back to the films, is the question of scale. I've seen, I, I felt that come up in a kind of number of discussions. What is, you know, because I think we sometimes, I think we have to be careful we don't assume that scaling up means taking something small and taking it to the national and the international scale. Some of these are not linear. Uh, and there are some forms of intervention, some ideas, some modes. I was uh, yesterday with Nicholas discussing this and he gave us a beautiful example, which I hope he'll bring up in the fishbowl of, you know, fantastic ideas that um, hit other ecological problems because you're trying to scale it up. And so the scale we mediate at in terms of policy, in terms of instruments, uh, of media, et cetera, we shouldn't assume that they naturally can scale up. And I think, so the question of scale, I hope, Mac, we can kind of uh, bring back uh, in the, yeah, in the fishbowl. Yes, I'll bring it in, I'll bring it in. And the third one, which sort of uh, occurred to me, and this is the last thing I'll, we'll end on, coffee, uh, is, you know, Teresa, something you very passionately brought up yesterday, uh, and you qualified that it was an emotive kind of response because it had been bottled up uh, about why isn't the community here, et cetera. And I think that is something we should also discuss because I was, you know, I, I know Sheila has said this many times, but you know, yesterday she introduced herself as an ambassador. And I was saying to her, maybe we should use the word mediators. And it made me think about Arjun Apudarai's definition of deep democracy, where he talks about civil society mediators, uh, folks who have a sense of the grassroots, but can also mediate with forces more powerful than communities, the World Bank and governments and, you know, all that kind of thing. And really, in that sense, we, I mean, this is about advocacy. I think a lot of us are advocates of different forms, and, and that becomes a contribution or becomes a role that we can become aware of, which is why, I mean, now speaking on behalf of the organizers, that the validity of even these discussions in a forum like this, because it's also the exchange between mediators that I, uh, I think has value to kind of add, and how we make these connections, of course, we have to be aware of. And then there is also the differentiation between advocacy in the way we are all engaged, and instruments for advocacy, which we sometimes don't differentiate. And I mean, for me, Michael's presentation was, I mean, that's another instrument for advocacy, uh, and, and, and they are varied. In this. So how do we, and sometimes some people are better at constructing instruments for advocacy. Academy does that, institutions does that. The others who are better at deploying those instruments and you know, the perfect ones are the ones who can do it all. Uh, and uh, we hope we have more of those that are produced. So I'm just flagging these out as issues that I, I'll bring back in the fishbowl, but I hope we can uh, continue our discussions around. So thank you very much. Thank you.